Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program. My name is Shireen Ash. I'm a librarian at the Corte Madeira Library, and I'm really pleased to join in this program tonight and invite you to participate in Moments in Marin History with Scott Fletcher, the author of this new history book um, on Marin County. So a couple things, a uh, little housekeeping. Please stay mute throughout the program. After Scott's presentation, there'll be time for questions and answers. As you think of questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And after Scott's talk, I will read them out so he can answer them. So again, stay mute throughout. And this program is being recorded and will be available on our website, on our YouTube channel rather, within two weeks. So a little bit about our speaker. Scott Fletcher is a longtime Marin resident, a former educator and a former library director at um, San Domenico School in San Anselmo. Since 2011, Scott has volunteered at the Marin History Museum, helping with cataloging and other, um, other, um, um, other activities. In addition, he's written 150 articles on Marin history. They form the basis of this book, and many of them have been published in the Marin IJ. So with that, Scott, share some stories with us, and right. um, there'll be time for questions again at the end. Thanks so much. Right. Thank you, Shireen, and thank you for setting this up. I really appreciate it. Um, my journey writing moments in Marin history began over 11 years ago when I was the library director at San Domenico School in San Anselmo. Previously, I had been both a history teacher and a school librarian in a number of schools throughout the county. On a bright spring morning in 2011, while I was weeding the library's collection of out-of-date material, I found a book on the shelf written by a long-forgotten geographer and Arctic explorer who had been born and raised right here in Marin County. Some of you may know who I'm talking about. Her name was Louise Arner Boyd. And I was astonished that I and everyone else had never heard of her. And I was doubly shamed because I was a geography major at UC Berkeley. And I used to take my kids up to Boyd Park to play when I lived in San Rafael. And I didn't know who Louise Arner Boyd was. So I spent some time reading online biographies and scouring the web for images of Louise. And then I ended up buying an official newsreel photograph of her on eBay returning from one of her expeditions in the 1930s. After a time, I felt the photograph should be given to the Marin History Museum. So I went to the Boyd Gatehouse in San Rafael. And while I spoke with the executive director about Louise and her long forgotten place in history, it was then that I was asked that fateful question, do you want to volunteer? Well, the rest as they say is history. I've worn many hats for the Marin History Museum, including helping to catalog the Louise Arner Boyd collection of artifacts and images. For the last five years, I've also written over 150 Marin History columns that have been published in the IJ newspaper. Each column begins with a photograph that I've selected from the museum's vast collection of 200,000 images. As those images are the foundation for the chapters in my book, I'd like to give you a preview of a few of them now. And here we go. One of my favorite images in the book is this very unique photograph of young Sausalito couples around 1890. It captures the warm and playful spirit of the Sausalito flirtation group. And it's unlike most photographs of the era due to its cheerfulness, movement, and spontaneity. Notice the older chaperone, Mrs. Q.T. Marion, to the right, keeping a close eye on her charges, and the slightly older couple in the rear, the Reverend Frederick Reed and his lovely fiance Ellie Reed, who sponsored the group and were leaders in the Southern Marin Episcopal Church community. Known in the early days of California statehood as Junction, the hub of San Anselmo, seen here circa 1900, has been the primary crossroads of the county for hundreds of years. First used by the Coast Miwok, the Junction has served travelers crossing the county in every compass direction. From horse and buggy days through the railroad era and into the automobile age, countless millions have passed through this intersection. 
A 2019 study estimated that over 60,000 cars pass through the hub on a daily basis. The town of Olima became an important population center after the discovery of gold as it set on the intersection of roads heading west to San Rafael and north and south to Tamales and Bolinas. Rafael Garcia was the largest landowner in the early Mexican land grant era, and in 1850, he hosted a large fiesta at his ranch on the occasion of a nearby shipwreck in Tamales Bay. The fiesta was attended by San Geronimo Valley resident Joseph Revere, the grandson of Paul Revere, who wrote a detailed description in his book, Keel and Saddle. From the wreckage of the vessel, barrels of wine, exotic foods, and cases of silken fabrics were cast ashore, all of which the local residents saved, which led to their celebration. Of that era, it is important to remember that California's first constitution was written in both English and Spanish. The bicycling craze that began in the 1890s has flourished in Marin well into the 21st century, where the innovation of the mountain bike and mountain biking evolved into the popular sport and pastime it is today. This group of cyclists, known as the San Rafael Wheelmen, are enjoying a sumptuous repast after a day of riding. Though the early cycling clubs were dominated by men, suffragette Susan B. Anthony said of the bicycle, it has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. It gives her a feeling of self-reliance and independence the moment she takes her seat. I stand and rejoice every time I see a woman on a bicycle. It took a German-born aristocrat, the Baron von Schroeder, to supply the scandalous behavior that was at the center of a great show trial in 1900, focused on the luxurious Hotel Raphael. The Baron had married into the wealthy Donahue family of Marin, and while his wife was away visiting his castles in Germany, the Baron was hosting what were called midnight orgies and drunken revels at their hotel. His late-night debaucheries horrified hotel guests and were printed in the San Francisco Call newspaper, which he sued for defamation of character and lost. A few years later, the Baron moved back to Europe to fight for Germany in World War I, and the hotel would eventually succumb to one of the era's most prolific pyromaniacs and arsonists. The next photograph truly captures a moment in time as sack racers propel themselves towards the finish line. The early May Day celebration was attended by thousands and featured maypole dancing, baseball games, races, live band music, and the exhilarating spectacle of the era of balloon ascension. At this 1909 celebration, ground was also dedicated for the soon-to-be-built Tamil Pius Community Center that was a gift from the Kent family that would include a gymnasium, athletic fields, a swimming pool, and meeting rooms. An early silent film studio, the California Motion Picture Corporation, is one of the most intriguing entities that have called Marin home. The San Rafael studio featured the talents of Beatrice Michelina, a well-known opera diva of the time, and an early screen idol whose popularity rivaled that of, of Hollywood's Mary Pickford. Beatrice was not only a fine actress, but she also did her own stunts, which resulted in her almost drowning while crossing a river in the Santa Cruz Mountains and being knocked unconscious twice, once falling from a running horse and another time when she was unceremoniously dropped by her leading man. Though their 12 films received rave reviews, the studio could not compete against the powerful Hollywood distributors and the company folded in 1920. Unfortunately, their entire film stock went up in flames at the hands of local kids playing with fireworks. This beautifully composed photograph captures an early evening view of Mount Tamalpais from Chicken Point, the area along San Pedro Road in San Rafael known today as Bayside Acres. Chicken Point got its name from that area's 19th century poultry farms. W.T. Ortman, a longtime resident of San Rafael, recalled a boating excursion he took with 10 young couples in the early 20th century. They docked their boat at Chicken Point and one of their members climbed the cliff and serenaded the couples from high above. They then rowed the boat all the way to Point Richmond and woke up the caretaker at Winehaven and danced until the sun came up. According to Mr. Ortman, we had to make up our own entertainment. So, how do places in Marin get their names? When I'm driving or biking around Marin, I'm sure that I'm not alone in wondering how the many 
locations, streets, buildings, etc., were given their names. Hamilton Field in Nevada was named in honor of Lieutenant Lloyd Hamilton, a World War I flying ace. Lieutenant Hamilton flew for both England's Royal Flying Corps and the United States Air Service, earning ace status for both squadrons. Tragically, he was shot down and killed over Belgium in August of 1918, just three months shy of the end of the war. Marin has also had its share of famous residents. Eleanor Garotti was Marin's first Olympic champion. She became a national sensation at the age of 15, breaking records and winning national competitions as a sprint and middle distance swimmer. She competed in the 1928 and 1932 Olympics winning two gold medals, a silver and a bronze. Born on the island of Belvedere, she grew up in San Rafael and developed her talent while swimming at the old San Rafael Municipal Saltwater Baths that burned down in 1949. Born into a wealthy family who were leading citizens of San Rafael at the time, Louise Harner Boyd, Arctic explorer, photographer, and geographer, is without doubt one of the most widely traveled, curious, determined women of the last century. Her seven expeditions to Greenland and work in the Arctic regions were unparalleled at the time, and her journals and photographs are of great value today for scientists studying the effects of climate change on the Arctic regions. She received the prestigious Cullum Medal from the American Geological Society, only the second woman so honored. Later in life, she traveled the globe and even chartered a plane in 1955 to fly over the North Pole, becoming the first woman ever to do so. Though her entire family is buried here in Marin at Mount Tamalpais Cemetery, Louise, true to her nature, was cremated and arranged for her ashes to be scattered over Point Barrow, Alaska, in one last expedition to her beloved Arctic. What started in 1911 as a small fundraising event for the Larkspur Fire Department evolved into a 50 year long music and dance jamboree. Couples could dance under the stars on a 24,000 square foot dance platform in a redwood grove just outside of downtown Larkspur. The World War II years were the most popular era for the Rose Bowl dances with crowds of up to 4,000 dancing to the melodies of Bay Area swing bands. With the money from the dances, the Larkspur Fire Department never had to tax the citizens of the town for their fire equipment. Attendance at the weekend dances began to wane in the early 1960s, and the enormous wooden dance floor was eventually dismantled and the property sold to developers. That looks like a lot of fun. The initial dipsy run from Mill Valley to Stinson Beach occurred in 1904 as a bet between two avid hikers from San Francisco's Olympic Club. The following year, the club organized the first competitive race with over 100 runners participating. Exclusively run by men in its first years, a dipsy hike for women was added in 1918. However, the women's hike lasted only five years due to pressure from local churches and physicians and I can hear your groans coming, who objected to women, quote, putting undue stress on their bodies and compromising their reproductive systems. Incredibly, it wasn't until 1971 that women were once again allowed to run as official entrants in the race. Today, with its handicapping system, winners range in age from eight to 70 years old, with both men and women crossing the finish line first. Paul Sharon, seen here, was the 37 winner and first resident of Marin County to win the Dipsy. Marin joined in the fight during World War II when the Bechtel Corporation built a shipbuilding port known as Marin Ship in Sausalito. Marin Ship brought thousands of workers to Marin from around the U.S., including many people of color. The workers at the shipyard built 93 cargo ships and oil tankers over the next four years. Marin City, built in a matter of weeks to house the shipyard workers, would become the first planned integrated community in the United States. At the end of the war, most of the white Marin City residents moved away and found jobs and homes around the Bay Area. Unfortunately, the minority workers were unable to move out of Marin City to surrounding communities due to the racist real estate covenants and racial profiling that in some cases, unfortunately, still exist to this day. The recent debate over renaming Sir Francis Drake High School gave me the opportunity to learn more about the amazing life of Archie Williams. 
Archie grew up in Oakland, California, dreaming of attending UC Berkeley and flying airplanes. He worked tirelessly to make both of those dreams come true while winning gold medals at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. His appointment as an instructor for the Tuskegee Airmen and his long career in the United States Air Force, where he retired as a lieutenant colonel, preceded his 20 plus years as a dedicated, caring, and beloved teacher at Drake High School. One of the more enjoyable experiences I had researching this book was interviewing surfers Peter Phibbs and Alan Reeves, seen here as teenagers in 1985, leaving the Stinchin Beach surf at sunset. Both men are now in their 50s, but remember the day well captured by IJ photographer Frankie Frost. Through phone interviews, I learned about closeout and peaky waves and the frightening red triangle of shark infested waters. To put it into their own words, they were totally stoked to be riding the waves that cold winter day. So those are just a few of the images from moments in marine history. Um, I'd now like to ride, uh, ride, read two selections from the book. The first, the full article on that scoundrel, the Baron von Schroeder and the Hotel Raffel, and the second of, I hope, um, local interest to those of you in Corte Madera. And I have to go leave this and add something else. Can you see that? Um, why don't you start it for us? There we yeah. go. Looks great. And you just the want elegant to Hotel Raffel built in 1888, was Marin's first luxury hotel and soon became the center of San Rafael High Society. Designed after the Del Monte Hotel in Monterey, the Bay Area's social elite came by ferry to Marin and then traveled by train or horse and carriage to the Dominican area hotel. Up to 225 guests could enjoy the 101 rooms and activities such as horseback riding, bowling, billiards, dancing, golf and sailing, followed by fine dining and drinking in a first-class restaurant and saloon. The hotel's tennis courts were also the location for the annual Pacific States Tennis Tournament, where local athletes could compete against nationally known players from the Western U.S. In 1895, Mary Ellen Donahue, the daughter of industrialist and railroad magnate Peter Donahue, inherited the hotel as part of her father's $12 million estate. She and her husband, the wealthy German-born Baron von Schroeder, bought out the partners in the hotel and expanded its operations. Within a few years, the Baron's dissolute, scandalous parties and his behavior towards female guests soon put the hotel in financial and legal trouble, resulting in one of the first show trials um, of the 20th century. In December 1900, the Baron brought a $250,000 suit for libel against John D. Spreckles in his San Francisco Call newspaper for printing the accounts of hotel guests who were shocked at what they had witnessed. Newspaper headlines reported on the midnight orgies and drunken revels that the Baron hosted and the damage to the hotel's reputation that the shocking immoralities and gross festivities visited upon the establishment. The jury spent less than three hours deliberating and found in favor of Spreckles and the call, further tar tarnishing von Schroeder's reputation. Though the Hotel Raphael was never very profitable under the von Schroeders, life returned to normal after the trial, and the wealthy clientele returned to enjoy the hotel's accommodations and the many sports tournaments, banquets, and local events. In 1910, the Baron, ignoring the San Rafael official safety concerns, refused to install fire escapes in the hotel and shuttered the building. At the outbreak of World War I, von Schroeder returned to Germany to take up duties as an officer in the German army, and he left the hotel and his other properties in California deeply in debt. When the U.S. entered the war, the hotel was confiscated by the government's alien property custodian and held in receivership until all his debts could be paid. The hotel and grounds fell into disrepair and numerous efforts to reopen the property never materialized. In 1918, the hotel was converted into a hospital to care for those suffering from the devastating worldwide influenza epidemic and the convalescing soldiers injured in the war. Both the Dominican Sisters of San Rafael and Red Cross volunteers nursed patients on the site. In 1921, the Hotel Rafael reopened for business and the new owners restored the grounds, installed electric lighting in all the rooms, along with the fire escapes, 
an elevator, and 40 private bathrooms. The refurbished hotel hosted Chamber of Commerce events, receptions, dances, weddings, and proms, and a return to its glory days. Three years later, the hotel was purchased by the Van Noy Interstate Company, which planned to operate hotels from San Rafael to Eureka to serve the growing number of automobile travelers. Tragically, on Sunday, July 29, 1928, a fire started in one of the upper floors and the damage was so severe that the hotel was razed to the ground, though there were no serious injuries or to guests or firefighters. A few weeks later, an 18-year-old convicted arson and pyromaniac, William Harrison Fisher, was arrested in Oakland and confessed to setting the blaze. Fisher had been incarcerated in the Eldred State Institution in Sonoma County since he was 14 for numerous arson convictions. He had recently escaped and fled to Colorado where he was rearrested and sent back to Oakland to, get this, live with his grandmother. During the few weeks he was living in Oakland, he torched the Hotel Rafael, an apartment building in Alameda, and two other hotels in the East Bay. He was known to local firehouses for his past arson convictions, and they put the police on his trail. Fisher told police he enjoyed setting fires and then watching the firemen and their equipment arrive at the location and attempt to put out the infernos. In San Rafael, he took police and fire authorities on a tour of the hotel burn site and described in detail how he did the deed and what he remembered of that day's excitement. His knowledge of the event was so accurate that the San Rafael City Fire Chief stated, he must have been at my heels all afternoon. He has told of incidents it would be impossible for him to describe had he not been present. So William Harrison Fisher, that was the end of that article on Hotel Rafael. And now we'll look at something of local interest. Scott, I was wondering if you could maximize the screen so we don't see your uh, screensaver behind. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think that's good. Okay. Thanks. Well, sorry about that. That's all right. I don't see where I can maximize it. All right. All right. From its earliest days of statehood, Marin County has been home to cattle and dairy ranching. Beef cattle dominated the early years, but soon gave way to dairy ranching as San Francisco's population continued to grow after the discovery of gold. God, the 18th, yeah. I'm sorry, you want to just click out so we don't see the bar? All right. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, by the 1870s, many Swiss and Portuguese immigrants, immigrants began settling in Marin to raise cattle and operate dairies that ship butter, cheese, and milk to the growing city. The towns of Tamales and Bolinas were important shipping ports along with smaller wars on the Point Reyes Peninsula and Tamales Bay. One of the largest and most modern was the Meadow Sweet Farms Dairy in what is now Corte Madera. Established in 1929, it sat nestled against the hills just south of today's Tamil Pius Drive, just above the library. The dairy was the brainchild of Frank Kiever and his wife, Hazeltine Sherman. Frank was a Canadian-born engineer who made a substantial fortune in the mining business, and Hazeltine was the daughter of Harriet and Moses Sherman, a wealthy land developer and owner of a railway in Southern California. The Shermans had previously bought 60 acres of land named Overmarsh next to their home in Corte Madera. That parcel was once part of the San Clemente stock farm owned by the Valentine brothers, Thomas and Sampson. The brothers raised horses and raced them on a mile long track adjacent to the railroad line near today's village shopping center. Kiever then purchased a large tract of nearby marshland and drained the area with a complex system of floodgates creating over 1400 acres of prime pasture land. The Meadowsweet Farms dairy became the model for modern Marin County dairies. They imported purebred Guernsey cows, purchased state-of-the-art milking machines, tested their stock for disease, and insisted on ultra-sanitary conditions. Meadowsweet originally produced grade A raw milk, but expanded their product line over the years to include pasteurized milk, buttermilk, butter, and eggs. 
For the next 15 years, Meadowsweet Dairy was the principal industry in the area and was described as a state-of-the-art dairy to produce milk and cream of unsurpassed quality. The Kievers eventually divorced in 1937 and the delivery routes were sold to rival Borden Dairy. The dairy and its 1,400 acres of pasture land were sold to Hugh Porter for $225,000. Porter expanded the operations of the Meadowsweet plant and operated it under the Marindel Dairy name, which he had leased. The Meadowsweet Dairy name lived on, however, as the Sherman family shipped their herd to Calexico, where they operated a new Meadowsweet Dairy along the border of California and Mexico. An interesting and somewhat amazing postscript to the story is that the young man who helped ship the Sherman stock to Calexico and would go on to be the new dairies manager for close to 20 years was one Paul Glud. Why amazing? Because in 1931, when he was just 22 years old, the following notice appeared in the Petaluma Argus Courier. Excuse me. Dairy hand was gored by bull. His left lung punctured by the horn of a bull suddenly gone mad. Paul Glud, 22, Cordomadero Dairy employees believed to be dying at Ross General Hospital. Fellow employees rescued him from the infuriated animal as it set itself for a second attack. Glud, an employee of the Meadowsweet Dairy at Cordomadero, attempted to beat down the attack with a heavy shovel as the bull charged for a second time. Okay, so that's the Meadow Sweet Dairy. Um, anyway, little did I realize back in 2011 that the simple act of finding Louise Arner Boyd's book on a library shelf would substantially change the direction of my life. At the time, I didn't see all this coming, and I am so happy that it did. Um, I guess in my case, it proves the old adage that from little things, big things grow. Um, and as I conclude tonight, I'll leave you with this thought. Keep an eye out for those little things. You never know that where they might lead. So thank you very much. And I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have about the book or my journey writing it. I know that Shireen has hopefully some questions already queued up. So Shireen? Well, First of all, thank you. Um, really wonderful stories, really interesting. I do want to open it up for other questions. And just as a, as a fellow librarian, I love that your journey started with um, the finding of an obscure book. And <laughs> how that, that just got, got yeah. you started on your journey. I always think that, you know, there's that wonderful sense of serendipity in a library where you can find, right. um, find lots of, lots of things. So if, if any of you all have um, questions, please put them in the chat. Don't be shy. Um, getting a, a really lovely thank you. So um, I'll start us off. Sure. What was, um, I mean, you, you told us some of the more exciting, dramatic stories, but is there a favorite story that you have? Um. Let's see. Well, you know, one one favorite story that unfortunately didn't make it into the book, um, Melba Beals, who was one of the um, Little Rock Seven, and she was a teacher here in Marin for many, many years. I actually got to interview her over the phone a couple of times. I wrote an article that did appear in the newspaper. Um, and that was kind of a highlight for me to get to speak to her for two, three hours about her experiences. She came here to live right after the 1956 desegregation in Little Rock, Arkansas, and lived with a, a Caucasian family up in Sonoma County. So it's a really interesting story. So that was wonderful. Unfortunately, I couldn't get her publicist to grant permission to put it in the book. Um, but that was that was one story that I really wished could have gone into the book. Um, I, I kind of picked my favorite ones for for this, um, but I really like some of the stories. There's one about, um, I think it's called the Mountaintop Home, and it's it was a little hotel up on top of Mount Tam, and um, this 
couple ran it for years and years. It was on the stagecoach ride. And then uh, eventually um, it was on the road up there. And I like the stories of the kind of common person who, who does something really kind of amazing for the county and maybe didn't get, you know, the notoriety or the, or, or the accolades that the Kents got, or, you know, the shavers or, or like the Baron, uh, you know, the bad reputation. So. Some of those unsung heroes, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, unsung heroes. Yeah. 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 I was um, curious about um, Louise. Is it Arner Boyd? Louise Arner Boyd. Yeah, her her maiden, her mother's maiden name was Louise Arner. Mm. So, you know, she sounds like an extraordinary person. Is there more written about her? Or um, when I discovered her, there had not been written a a print biography of her. Um, there's now three, I think, one one juvenile and and two that are um, for adults. Um, and it, she is amazing. And I mean, this all happened at a time when women were kind of expected to, you know, find the right mate and and settle down and have kids. She was born in 1887. And she was from a very wealthy family and there were high expectations of her. She was actually presented to the King and Queen of England when she was in her, I believe, late twenties. Mm -hmm. um, but on that trip, she took a boat out and went up into the North Atlantic and saw some Arctic ice. And she was just actually transfixed by it. And that started her interest. And the interesting thing is, is that she had two older brothers who both died in their teens of um, uh, it was like heart conditions brought on by um, some kind of um, disease that they had when they were kids. So the family had lost both of their sons. She became the only child, helped her father run his business, and he was extremely wealthy. And when her parents died, she had millions and millions and millions of dollars. And she decided, I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have kids. I'm going to go pursue my interest in photography, geography, and exploring the Arctic regions. So uh, just an amazing person. Yeah, quite extraordinary decision mm -hmm. for someone at that time or yeah, mostly, yeah. most times. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. So um, thanks for the questions that have come in. So um, uh, Joan asked, was there a railway up Mount Tam and also comments that she loved the program. Can you talk um, about the railway? Yeah, there, there was a railway up Mount Tam. Um, you know, we refer to it as the crookedest railroad in the world. I think it was the Mount Tamil Pius and Muir Woods Railway at one point. Um, and um I believe it was put in right around like 1902 or 1904, something like that. And then they extended it to Muir Woods. Um, but it by the 1930s or 40s, the car had had taken over everything and they were building roads. And so the railroad ceased to exist. And I'm I think it, it ceased that one ceased to exist in the late 20s or early 30s. Um, the railroads in central Marin ran all the way from Sausalito or Tiburon all the way up to Sonoma County, running through central Marin and then out to West Marin. And I think the last train on those on that railroad was like 1966 or 1967. But the amazing thing is that you could get from San Francisco, take a ferry, get on a train and be in West Marin in a little over an hour. Yeah. Wow. And that 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 beats most commutes nowadays. It certainly does. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to just add a little plug for the Antique Kent California Room, um, which is in our um, uh, Civic Center Library. And there's a lot of information on the website, images and so forth about um, the trains in particular, as well as other things. But uh -huh. um, um, Lisa comments that she loved the book and the stories and notes that it must have been difficult to choose from among them and asks if you have any plans to publish a second <laughs> book with more stories, recognizing, of course, that you've just 
Right. Um, yes, I, I am seriously considering it. Um, I, I need to take a little bit of time off. Um, I'm still writing the articles and I have a deadline every two weeks. So that's something that I'm, I'm still doing. Um, but I do plan to do a volume two and, um, I'm probably thinking more like 2024 maybe, um, because this has been absolutely wonderful. It's changed my life and all that, but I've been doing this almost every day for a year and a half. And <laughs> I'd like to take a little time off. So, but yes, I am planning on doing a second, a second volume because now I've, I've added another probably 40 or 50 articles since I started writing this book, which was in I think March or April of last year is when I started writing the book. So I, you must do a fair amount of research before. Each yeah. Article. Um, you know, the way, the way it works is I spend a few hours going through the collection. It's, it's in a um, facility up in um, Bell Marin Keys, the Marin History Museum. That's where their large collection is. And I find photographs that are of interest to me and are of high enough quality to be reproduced in the newspaper and online. I take a picture of them, bring them home, and then spend usually between about 10 and 15 hours a week on, on an article. And I, I use web pages, I use books from the library, um, I use online um, websites. And I also use Ancestry.com and um, two um, newspaper databases, which I feel are are really what give my articles a somewhat different uh, texture to the writing, because I'm often quoting from 1900 or 1880 or 1920, and the language is very different, and sometimes it's very dramatic, and also I'm a I have to assume that they probably got most of it right if they're writing about it the day after it happened. So um, I use the newspaper databases a lot um, to write my articles and to also check my facts, because I think, as you know, and probably everyone else knows, it's very dangerous to just take something off a web page and feel like, you know, uh, you've got the real story. Yeah, exactly. It, it is great to go to that original source material yeah. like you say to get a flavor of the time yeah. times in the language um so carrie writes was great to hear about louise boyd and sad to think about how many buildings were lost to fire um, oh you know if you read the book i would say a good 25 to 30 percent of them end in a fire especially hotels. Um, I think, um, and I didn't really plan to do this, but the hotels were often the center of a, a community. Um, and even something like Samuel P. Taylor Park and Samuel Taylor, they had a hotel out there. Well, every hotel burned down at least once, if not twice. One of them burned down three times, I think. You know, and basically wood structures, candlelight, possibly gas, you know, lighting in the hotel and fireplaces and kitchens and you put all that together and you know there weren't any um fire extinguishers back then or fire alarms so things just burnt down and they rebuilt maybe mm. so it's an interesting note of the difference in today and yeah. um, you know the real the the one that really breaks my heart is the um the film vault for the california motion pictures mm -hmm. um thank goodness um, someone found a print of their most famous film, which was actually shown here not that long ago, four or five years ago, um, in Australia, they had a print and they've re redone one of their films, but that's the only film that they have. Um, and so you can see Beatrice Michelina and all these great shots in Marin County. Um, but that's the only one. I wanted to, um, ask if there were any more questions. We're gonna end the program in about 12, 15 minutes. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to ask any follow-up questions. I wanted to say that I really appreciated learning about your process and the research that goes into it. Um, 
you know, it's particularly interesting and nice to know that those resources are available. Yeah. You, you have the opportunity to dig deep. I also thought it was um, personally kind of amusing and interesting to hear about that there was a bicycling club and that that's just, it's been a, a through, 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 through thread, I guess, you know, that, yeah. that they're well, still know, bicycling in Marin. I, I know. And, and one of the things that, that I, I didn't realize the extent of the bicycling craze in the 1890s, when the bicycle came in, you know, all of a sudden you didn't have to have a horse or rent a wagon to get someplace really quick. And, and it, it allowed people to have that freedom to move about and the newspapers are just full, 1890, 1892, 1895, 1900, of bicycle races through San Rafael, 200 participants. There were bicycle clubs in virtually every town, and they went up Mount Tam, and as you saw from that photograph, they brought along their lunch and a lot of champagne, because <laughs> they were all pouring champagne at the in that photograph, if you look closely, so... Um, it's been around a long time. So some things have changed and some things not so much. That, exactly. <laughs> so a great question. Um, where can we acquire the book? Ah, um, well, it is in at least six or seven libraries, but you may have to wait for it. If you'd like to purchase it, um, it's at Book Passage. It's at all three Copperfields, Larkspur, um, San Rafael and Novato. It's also at the Depot Bookstore in Mill Valley. And I think it uh, it's, was the old booksmith. I forget what it's called now here in San Anselmo. But you can also order it online at Amazon or Barnes and Noble. And if for some reason you're having trouble finding it, email me and I'll get you a copy. <laughs> I've got a stack downstairs. Personal but service. Yeah, of, but 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 try the others first because uh, I'll run out pretty quick if everyone gets them from me. <laughs> it's nice to know there's so many um, bookstores still left yeah. in Marin, uh -huh. and, and of course at your library. So um, right. thank you for asking that because I know that it's people are going to want to read it. All the stories you didn't have time for. Yeah, uh, if, and if if you're used to online buying, if you just put moments in Marin history into Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any online book dealer, more than likely it's going to pop right up. So. Um, thank you for that clarification. Any further questions? Any favorite stories you want to hear about your corner of Marin? <laughs> Do you have a story about the seminary? Um, uh, I don't have one per, that's ab absolutely about the seminary. I have a couple of San Anselmo. I did do one on the seminary for, um, the article I wrote in the newspaper, but the image was not all that great. And one of the criteria I had for the book is that the image had to be one, you know, one of the better images, um, and there were a, like there was one I wanted to do of Ross, um, but the image was just so poor that I just thought, yeah, I, I don't want to put that in there. So, um, but the seminary is mentioned in two or three of the articles. So, there's one on the Dominican sisters and Dominican um, university and college. Um, most people haven't heard of Tokaloma. That was a town out past Samuel P. Taylor Park that had a great big hotel and a lot of the bicycle clubs used to go out there. Of course, that burned down twice. Um, there's a couple in about Point Reyes, one about um, Tamales, uh, one about the San Geronimo Valley. And I, I always find it interesting. Um, I think I quoted in, in that one uh, summary about uh, the fiesta that Paul Revere's grandson was a land uh, was one of the first landowners in the San Geronimo Valley, uh, and he had come here as part of the Bear Flag Rebellion, and supposedly had raised the American flag in Sonoma when the Bear Flag Rebellion took over uh, occupancy of Cal California, basically, and as he was riding back 
through Marin on his way back to the capital, which was Monterey, he passed through San Geronimo Valley and said, this is the loveliest valley in all of California. And he purchased it from the land grantee, the, the Mexican land grantee. And he uh, farmed there for a number of years. So, um, you know, I think that's a really interesting sidelight that we had Paul Revere's grandson here. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So um, Lisa comments that the story of Blackie is fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's in the book. And th that was, you know, funny, that one was a tough one because there are so many competing ideas and stories about Blackie. And, you know, I used to say to people, oh, I saw Blackie. I can remember seeing Blackie when I first moved here. Well, he died in 1967 and I didn't move here until 1985. And I think a lot of people feel like that because they've driven by the statue and they've heard the story. And also the brothers that owned him, there were two brothers that brought him out. I think they brought him out here in the twenties or early thirties. He was a rodeo horse. Um, and they gave many interviews to many newspapers through the years and they're often, their facts are often very uh, conflicting. <laughs> so it was kind of hard to unravel the story of Blackie. But yeah, that was, uh, I got a great letter from someone who was in their 70s and remembered feeding Blackie apples and, you know, told, told me that it really reminded him of his youth when he would go down to the, uh, the, the pasture and feed Blackie. Well, that's rewarding. Yeah, yeah. But you no, must have gotten it, you must have gotten some of the facts right then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and that's a that's another highlight. Um, one of my photographs, it didn't make it into the book. I think it'll make it into the next one. Um, I received a um, email from a woman. She's probably sixty ish or sixty five ish, and she said, "I have that photograph." in my parlor. That's my, that's my grandmother. Who's the little girl in the photograph. It was taken about, I think about 1900 or 1898. And so I get, I get emails from people saying, Oh, you know, I remember that, or, you know, that was my grandmother. And so that's really rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. So um, thanks. Got a couple more questions and we have mm -hmm. time for them. So someone asked about the cemetery in San Rafael with famous people buried at it. It's the one next to the guide dogs. Do you have any information about that? Uh, Mount Olivet. Yeah, that was one of the original cemeteries. Um, and um, I know that Rafael Garcia is buried there and he was one of the original land grantees. And so was Pedro Sias, who was a, a lot of the original land grantees that were Californios from Mexico are buried there and so are a lot of others. Um, and then the Tamil Pius Cemetery in San Rafael out at the end of Fifth Street also has a lot of kind of the early settlers as well. Um, but I think the Mount Olivet Cemetery was the original one because it was closer to San Rafael at the time. So um, you can go there and look at, you know, there's, I think Pedro Sias's grave is from like 1848 or something like that, or 1845 or something like that. It really goes back a long, a long ways. Thank you. Um, and um, a listener comments that, you know, appreciate all the local book bookstores and um, asks if there are any tales about the Corte Madera Hotel at the railroad station near Menke Park. Um, I did write an article about um, the railroad station that was at Minky Park, and that didn't make it into the book. Um, it was one of my um, articles, and um, I mentioned the hotel in that. I don't have a lot of information about that. That was one of my really early ones. I, I probably wrote that in 2018 or something. Um, but I, I had written an article about that, but I don't know too much about it. But it's great to go to Minky Park now because a couple of the buildings are still there that go all the way back to 1850, 1860. In um, behind where the um, gazebo is, there are some businesses and obviously they've, they've remodeled them and you know shored them up. But a couple of those buildings are original. And I think one of them might be 
the hotel. I wanted to ask, um, uh, I guess, a final question then is, have you collaborated or worked with any of the local historical societies like the San Anselmo Historical Society, for instance? Um, yeah, well, um, I've, in writing my articles, I, I often will contact someone like Judy Coy at the San Anselmo. I've talked to Dewey Livingston a number of times. Uh, he's, you know, probably our most famous local historian. Uh, out in West Marin. Um, I've worked with the Sausalito Historical Society. Um, and, you know, I, I always kid myself, I'm, I'm kind of the rookie of, of local history here. You know, this has been the last four or five years. And um, I just recently gave a talk at the Ross Historical Society and um, Richard Torney has been has been here forever. He grew up here and, you know, he's probably 75 or something like that. And I get to meet these people and we get to pick each other's brain. And, you know, sometimes they'll say, you know, you got the date wrong. It was not 1892, it was 1882 or something like that. So, um, but it, it it's really great to get to talk to these folks. And I feel really honored to be the rookie in the in the dugout with these you know local historians it's like an honored position i was thinking someday maybe we should do a panel discussion with all of you yeah yeah no it'd be great it would be it'd great be a and, lot of oh, you know what though you'd have to give it four or five hours because <laughs> some of them it, you say hello and before you know it you've got a 20 minute story about like the the founding you know settlers of ross or the, you know <laughs> so we we do go on we historians yes but pleasurably so <laughs> so um with that i am going to say okay last call for questions i think carrie likes the idea of a panel so maybe we'll work on that right but um i i think that's it for the evening and i just want to extend my heartfelt thanks i my little story is that scott came into the library and said could I donate this book? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> oh, oh, yes, you can. Thank you very much. And um, we ended up with this program. So again, one little thing leads to another. So it was, I really appreciate your efforts, writing the book, researching and sharing your great stories and knowledge. Um, and uh, everyone is, you're getting a lot of thanks and appreciation. Mm -hmm. So I am going to, end the uh, event and thank you all for coming and have a lovely evening. Thank you, Sharina. Thank you I'm so sure we'll talk in the next day or two. Yeah, I hope so. Bye. All right. Be well. Really great. All right. Thank That's you so everybody fun. for coming and all putting right. up with me. <laughs> it's, great. it's our pleasure. All right. <laughs> Night everyone. Good night. And you're very welcome all.